All right, hello everybody and welcome to our first roundtable of the semester. My name is Savannah and I am the producer for the Roxborough House Roundtables at Jefferson East Falls. Each episode is recorded and later posted on our YouTube and SoundCloud for those who are not able to make it to the live event. They are also aired on the first and third Sundays of each month from 8 to 9 a.m. on G-Town Radio 92.5 FM WGGT. Today's roundtable is hosted by Professor Evan Lane and the Associate Director of Career Services, Patrick Ryan. Since Constitution Day was this week, we will be talking about the Supreme Court and if there are any restraints to their power. I'll hand it off to Patrick Ryan. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everyone. It looks like we have a great group here uh, today. Uh, and just wanted to mention that, yes, this is our Constitution Day special. Constitution Day is September 17th, for all that did not know. And the fun fact is that any institution that receives federal funding must celebrate and host a program on or near Constitution Day as a part of their financial aid requirements. And so welcome to this Constitution Day special. We're happy to have you, especially talking about the precedence that's being set with the SCOTUS in uh, the courts today. So Evan, welcome. Okay, I want to mention again, it's Constitution Day. <laughs> so we get our funding, so everyone's happy, right? Okay, we can continue as a university now. Thank I'm very, you. Very excited. Uh, Law and Society is now responsible and career services for keeping the university alive and well, so I think shout out to us. Thank you. Uh, I would like, before we get into the ethics of the Supreme Court, I do want to talk about one particular justice and a little bit of history that goes into it that you may or may not be aware of, and that's uh, Clarence Thomas. And the reason why we bring it up is because we're sitting here in the All Inspector Center, there's a big portrait of All Inspector up there, and All Inspector had a whole lot to do with Clarence Thomas, uh, his approval as a Supreme Court Justice, because he was a member of the Judiciary Committee along with current President uh, Joe Biden. When Thomas was picked, it was no question he was picked to replace the only sitting, the first sitting black justice on the Supreme Court. Um, that justice was very liberal. He had um, pioneered civil rights, very strong. Um, Thurgood Marshall was one of the greatest civil rights leaders our country's ever known, one of the best lawyers for civil rights, and he was the first black uh, member of SCOTUS. He was being replaced. So in that, po at that play point, because he was retiring because of old age and, and bad health, uh, George uh, Bush, uh, the senior, was president of the United States at that time. And to put it very clearly, he had to fill the black seat, as they put it. And they looked around for a, um, a judge who was of color and to see who could replace Thurgood Marshall. And that was Clarence Thomas. At that point, there weren't many uh, judges of color, especially those who would be on the Republican conservative side. Clarence Thomas had been a judge for about a year and a half. Uh, in, he was a uh, appellate court judge in the federal system. Uh, he had not handled any major cases or any major legislation or review of any kind. Uh, and for all those who are thinking fairly at the time, he was picked not because of his qualifications, because of how he looked. He was one of the first Supreme Court uh, nominees not supported by the Bar Association. What that means is prior to that time, it was very important to get Bar Association approval. That was a, a if it wasn't the official um, statement of being qualified, at least it was the unofficial one. And every Supreme Court justice before then who was nominated and approved of had a positive rating. He did not. Uh, the reason why is he didn't have the necessary experience as a judge. He had not put in his time, and he had not entered any important decisions. So when Specter, who was in the Judiciary Committee and a very important member of it, and the Judiciary Committee, so you know how procedure works, first approves or disapproves of the nomination. If they approve, then it goes for a vote. If they disapprove, it does not. So he was a very important member of the Judiciary Committee to whether or not he would be approved or not. So he interviewed Clarence Thomas. He came into his office, and there's actually pictures of that upstairs in the Specter Center of them standing next to each other with a picture afterward. And he said to Clarence Thomas, um, I'm very uh, big supporter of affirmative action. Uh, what are your views on affirmative action, especially a case called the Burt's case? 
Uh, that case had to deal with women getting preference to getting broadcasting licenses over men because there weren't enough women owners in broadcasting. So uh, the inspector said, what do you think of that case? What do you think of affirmative action? And Clarence Thomas said, uh, I have no problem with affirmative action. So Spector had no problem with Clarence Thomas. And then the day of the vote, a couple weeks go by, the day of the vote, a local newspaper in DC, and I forgot its name, puts an article out there and says that Clarence Thomas has not handled any important cases in the year and a half he's been there, except one. It's called the Lembrick case. And the Lembrick case had to deal with a woman applying for a broadcasting license and whether or not the affirmative action of the case I mentioned previously would apply. It was a three-judge panel. Two judges were against the Mertz case, were against affirmative action, were very critical of affirmative action. And guess which one of those judges were? Clarence Thomas. But here's the thing. When he told Spectre he had not decided any cases or had any official opinions on affirmative action, he was telling the truth because this is the game he played. And this is the person we're talking about in the rest of this. He did not sign the opinion. It was on his desk for three months, three months before he met with Spectre to have that meeting. It was on his desk because he knew he was being considered as a possible Supreme Court justice. He did not sign it. So officially, for those who don't know, it is not an opinion until he signs it. So although he wrote it, and although he was the judge who was writing the majority opinion, two to one, he was the one writing the opinion, saying he doesn't like affirmative action, that that case is no good, he doesn't agree with it, but if he doesn't sign it, it doesn't officially become a case, a decision. So when he went into Spectre and said, well, I haven't had any decisions on affirmative action, technically, he was telling the truth. Technically. He was affirmed. After he was affirmed, for one hour, I think it was, he was officially assigned back to the appellate division, went, signed the opinion, and then went back to the Supreme Court. So that's Clarence Thomas. And that's who we're going to be talking about today. Uh, when I asked, Spectre had passed on by the time I wrote the book, and this is in my book, not to shill it. Um, but I asked his two legal assistants that Spectre relied on very heavily. I said, if, how come you guys didn't find this in your research? Because they do the research for Spectre, you know, as being his assistants, legal assistants. And they said, because it wasn't a case to find. Until it's signed, it doesn't appear anywhere. The only place it appeared would be on Clarence Thomas' desk. So we obviously have no, uh, no access to that. So we didn't know about that. So I said to them, do you think it would have affected, because Spectre did vote for him. I said, do you think it would have affected his vote and his approval of Clarence Thomas as a judge? And they said, listen, you never know. You know, this is in the past, but it would have come out in those hearings. We can tell you that. That there's no question when he was appearing in front of Congress and being questioned about various other things we won't get into right now, without doubt, all inspector would have asked him about that. It would have become public knowledge that he wasn't exactly um, truthful with uh, Spectre. And who knows what could have happened as a result of that. So I find that a very interesting thing. We're dealing with his character. Second thing we should also know about Clarence Thomas, his wife, Ginny, is extremely active in very right-wing causes. Very active to the point that she's been in charge of many different organizations that are very strongly right-wing organizations. When I practice law, um, every judge, and still, if that's the way it is, is subject to an ethics rule. Every judge in America, and if you have, and they call it the appearance of impropriety, the appearance that you, are, uh, that you are biased, you have to step down from the case. Uh, it's very clear. The judge says, well, I, I'm friends with that lawyer, or I know that company, or I've done business with that company, or I've supported that candidate who has a problem in front of the court. 
I have to step down because I cannot be unbiased. Even if I say I'm fair, it's the appearance of impropriety that someone down the road will say, well, you know, you knew that guy, you knew that woman, you knew that company, you shouldn't have been involved. Every judge has to do that except nine. And that's the Supreme Court justices. The Supreme Court justices are not subject to the rules of ethics by the American Bar Association. And that's an amazing thing. So they police themselves. And I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I'm policing yourself. I remember I was in high school, and one of our, my chem teacher, uh, she had to work another job. So she said, is anyone in the class grade exams for me? And I'll give you the, the key. And I raised my hand, I said, sure. And just by coincidence, the nicest girls in my class seemed to get the highest scores when I was grading. I don't know how that happened, okay? And I always seem to get a high score, okay? I'm just saying, when you grade yourself, it's a problem, okay? Despite how ethical you might be. So that's Clarence Thomas, so I want to just State that. The second thing I want to talk about, and then I want to open up to your impressions of what you've heard so far, is these six Supreme Court justices recently have come as a result of recommendation, not by the Bar Association, but by a thing called the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society is a private group that is funded by rich right-wing billionaires. What they do is they research the most conservative justices they could find and then supply their names to senators and presidents as a recommendation. And right now there are six Supreme Court justices sitting who are Federalist Society picks. That's a new thing. That never happened before. It used to be judges from, a, from their reputation, from involvement in party politics or whatever it may be. But right now we have a society actually picking justices, and that's Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, um, let's see, Kavanaugh, Roberts, and Amy Coney Barrett. All of them were pre-selected by the Federalist Society, so that's something I just want to throw out there as well. So before we get into present Clarence Thomas issues and Judge Alito issues, I want to just go around the panel and say, did you? What is your impression of, is SCOTUS fair right now? Do you feel that it's representing our interests? So you? I mean, yeah, so with the information presented, right, I always had a natural assumption that the, the power that we give the judicial branch and the Supreme Justices was justified by the fact that they're relatively indifferent. But like, this information for them to be pre-selected by the Federalist Society, for like Clarence Thomas to have like, such a like basically just be chosen for his like color and right wing views um it's just like yeah it's very shocking to me it's very um it, it kind of like makes me question that absolute power or at least like the the way we appoint these judges and like maybe there should be a an adjustment or some kind of like third party that properly um, evaluates their ethics because remember they're there for life and they could be impeached, but it has to be really, really difficult to do it. And I, I don't think in present memory there's any judge that's been impeached. Who else would like to comment? You're drinking, so. <laughs> um, I, when I was first learning about the SCOTUS, I always thought it was, I understood why they were there for life and like why they were appointed by the president, because I was like, okay, so no one can threaten them, no one can blackmail them, they can just think their thoughts. But I feel like with all that stuff, they're taking advantage of it almost and like thinking things that aren't just in the Constitution, like interpreting it. They're also interpreting their own kind of beliefs that isn't so right. And yeah, um, I think they're definitely taking advantage of that power that they have. And that since it's so hard for them to get impeached, they're just doing whatever they please right now. Chad? I just feel like you know, they are our government, they are the ones, you know, creating the laws, saying what's right and wrong, but are they really, you know, for the people? Are they really the voice for the people? Are they really thinking about the people? And it just makes you wonder, like, they're just appointed for, you know, having the power to make decisions, 
but are they doing it to benefit the people or just themselves? The big question is, are they looking at cases objectively under the law, or do they have an agenda, a political agenda? And they're appointed for life for a reason, because the point of it is they're supposed to be above politics. Mm -hmm. But it appears that they're very much part of politics now. Yes, yeah, right? The reality of the situation is, is that by definition, while we say, oh, all judges need to be impartial, the truth is they will always have an agenda. There is no, there is no record in history of an agency not bound by politics, bias, personal opinion, somebody else's ethics, somebody else's ideas, and many, many more. Even things such as the Pope. The Pope is bound by earthly matters. Things as the President. The President is bound by petty matters. And so the same thing applies here with the Supreme Court. Well, yes, they are supposed to be impartial, but history has shown us that just because they're supposed to doesn't mean that they have to be. Because the truth is, no human being is perfect. And therefore, no human being can be fully impartial. Uh, so, I would agree with all those things. And I think that institutions that are the most removed from public affairs also have the most, uh, they're the most susceptible to be cor corrupted without the people's intervention, because I feel like the Supreme Court is so removed from the public sphere, the people, it, it will take years for us to either change the House or the Senate and then the President for us to make real changes when it will take, if, if the system was already working, then the government would take reactionary measures in, a, in seeing that there's something wrong, and but no action is being taken, I feel. It's just, it's corrupted, and you just have to wait until the system does something about it. The only thing the system can do is essentially wait for someone to die, right? Because it's the only way they get replaced these days, uh, no matter what they do, whether they're slightly biased or corrupt. Everyone is biased, Frank. I agree with you, it's a bias, but there's a difference between bias and corruption. Uh, and that's, you know, something we're going to talk about. Um, Anyone else care to come? Um, I think it's like because of the whole like, oh, they're there for life, and we have presidents that we don't really agree with who are placing justices there, and we're and then the president is not getting reelected, but we still have those justices sitting there and still abiding by that president's opinions. It's just honestly like we're moving backwards instead of forwards. Kind of go off that in your original question of does SCOTUS represent us currently? I'd have to say absolutely no, because former President Trump appointed, what, three justices, mm -hmm. right? And he lost the popular vote, so objectively speaking, that does not represent the majority of the country. So uh, as a president, especially for the foreseeable future, because he appointed three younger justices, mm -hmm. they don't, they're not going to represent us as a whole. They're going to be there decades, no matter who the presidents are. But the issue with what you just said is exactly that. Oh, it, uh, they don't abide by the popular vote, therefore they shouldn't be our justices. So what you're saying is people should only be in power if they follow the court of public opinion. Well, the question is, does SCOTUS represent public opinion? So in this case, no. I'm not looking at should, should that be the case. I'm saying that is the case. And, and SCOTUS shouldn't be, sometimes public opinion is wrong. For example, you, know, you had racism throughout our country, but you would hope that what they're doing is following the Constitution as, a fo as opposed to an agenda. And, that, and that's something that I, I want to talk about. And I want to talk particularly about, um, right now, Clarence Thomas. Um, Harlan Crow is a very, very powerful, very wealthy man. Oh, we have found that not through the transparency of Justice Thomas, but through Pro Republica, who's a, uh, a a nonprofit organization does research. We have found out that he has received, either in cash or in kind, gifts worth about a million dollars. Clarence Thomas has received about a million dollars worth of either trips or payments or whatever it may be from Hall and Crow. Now, I want to bring up one thing you probably don't know. A couple of years ago, Clarence Thomas came to Congress and said, I'm not getting paid enough money. 
I'm not making enough money. I'm a poor man. And if you don't increase my salary, I'm going to leave the court. After he made that statement, Congress increased the salary of Supreme Court justices to 300,000 from 150, and plus these gifts from Hall and Crow started coming Clarence Thomas's way. So these gifts include um, vacations to five, six stars, I mean five star stuff, you know, uh, um, yachts, personal planes, the best of things. Um, he, uh, Thomas has a younger man who he sort of adopted that he's been taking care of. Uh, Hall and Crow has paid for his private school at $6,000 a pop a month. Hall and Crow has paid, uh, bought his mother's, Thomas's mother's property for a nice profit. There's a lot, it, it all adds up to about a million dollars. And at these, these are just not Harlan and Clarence going fishing. With, when they go away, it's a lot of other billionaires are also part of this. And they sit together. So there's a beautiful picture that he circulated out there of him sitting there smoking cigars with a bunch of rich people. And they talk, and they have conversations, and they talk about policy. They talk about the Eagles game. So, these are where he's going. Now, if Thomas would say, yes, I, after it was revealed he had these trips, he kept them a secret. And he's actually supposed to, even with act of ethics, there is a law that says if you get gifts of a certain value, you're supposed to disclose it. And that includes the president, senators, and federal judges, which they are. He didn't disclose those, but if he was forced to because ProRepublica came out with it. He said, I wasn't influenced by that. So I went away on all these vacations with these people, and they treated me, and they took care of me when I, after I was threatening to leave. But I, that's not corruption. So I'm interested in your point of view on that. Do you, go ahead, Sam. I mean, I have a question. Like, so you, you said that like he's supposed to disclose this beforehand, right? Yeah. So um, are, are there any like other, uh, what's it called? Yeah, are there any other, like, what's the word for it? Like, sanctions? Sanctions, not, not exactly. Like, any other, like, restrictions. Restrictions to prevent, like, um, these, like, to prevent, like, judges from getting any sort of, uh, like, gifts or anything of that nature. If it was a state court judge? Yeah. A city judge? Yes. Because that's the appearance of impropriety. But not the Supreme Court. All right. Yeah, then, yeah, that's just... But what do you think that this is not corruption? I'm just going and having a good time free with all my friends. Technically, I mean, technically one could argue that like it is like that the actions of like them giving gifts is not necessarily corruption, but it gives a lot of leeway to it. So that I feel like is more an issue of the system than it is of individuals because people are going to exploit that any way, shape or form. So that's more a failing of, uh, of the way our government structure rather than rather than personal corruption on his yeah, way? rather rather than personal corruption because that's always going to be the case like you see that with any other country right bribery always happens right almost internationally Beatrice so if they're not like if they're allowed to receive gifts and stuff like that and it's not seen as problematic what like would constitute a, for them to be like turned out because from what I'm understanding they have a lot of power and they're not even like selected by like the citizens they're going to quote unquote be in charge of or take care of for. So what would like have to occur for them to be like impeached or for like someone to say okay like this is not working for the citizens? Yeah, how does that work? Through Senate and has to be uh, more than a majority vote. And so the chance of that happening is not happening. Uh, it's, starting, uh, it's the same impeachment process as for president. It starts in Congress. Um, AOC actually has brought impeachment papers against Clarence Thomas, uh, but that hasn't gone anywhere. Impeachment is like an indictment that has to be voted that he's committed or pr probable cause that he's committed these crimes of corruption. Then it goes to the Senate for a two-thirds vote. 
So the chance of that happening right now is, is zero. Uh, AOC is, is more, that's just a political move she's made. There's no way that's going anywhere. That's nice to know. <laughs> do you see, I'm going, um, what, how do you see it? Uh, well, I think this is a great uh, just example of the technicalities that people can fall into, right? Because although had these gifts been disclosed, it's not legal to do that as long as they've been disclosed. But it's also hard to imagine gifts of a million dollars or more continuing to pour in if the votes aren't going your way in the Supreme Court, right? Now, you can make an argument that you just keep the pedal to the metal and maybe you win some and you lose some too, but then as you continue to go to the opinions and the opinions continue to pile up in one direction versus the other, it's very hard to d distinguish influence or not influence and certainly as they pile up, it seems that there is a little bit of influence there and that the gifts do help and they seem to keep coming in. I, th I think it's hard to, even if it's on a subconscious level, you're hanging out with people in great circumstances, having lots of fun in beautiful places, everything's for free, and you're going to walk away from that not feeling good about these people and what they think and their policies. Right. Uh, it's really hard for me to, I think people have been bought for a lot less than a million dollars. It's hard for me to understand his logic that I'm just hanging out with friends. And I don't care if it's on the left or the right. No judge in the Supreme Court should be getting gifts from anybody for anything. Uh, it just has the appearance of impropriety. And when it's a million dollars, that's, that's a big appearance and a big impropriety as far as I'm concerned. And I don't think he's getting that, those gifts because they're friends. I think he's getting those gifts so he is being influenced and they're bringing him to these trips so he is around them and their opinion does go on him. So. Oh, okay. uh, I was just going to ask um, what your opinion would be on, let's say, increasing the salary uh, of, of the judges? Because I know in Singapore, or that, that's kind of a kind of I, I like international example, but in Singapore, like they do have high salaries for government officials, just to avoid problems like this, and I feel like that would be the only real correctable solution to um, to like the, the issue of gift giving for judges. It sounds good, but there's never any limit to greed. I mean, look at. Elon Musk, he's worth you know, a trillion dollars and he's involved in a lawsuit now with, with Tesla to get another 53 billion in stock options that he thought he was entitled to. Does he need any more money? Okay. The, the topic about, uh, oh, has the judge ever been impeached? It's been talked about a bit, so I have, I have the information right here. There has been in the history of the Supreme Court one justice who has ever been uh, impeached, and his name is Samuel Chase. A bit of background on him. And this is 1804, where his impeachment happens, and he's described as a staunch Federalist with a volcanic personality by the, uh, by the Senate website, Senate.gov. And the reason that he was impeached was because, as a Federalist, it's very well known that there was a lot of turmoil during this time and a lot of political infighting. And so what he does is, a lot of cases, he either votes in favor of people who were Federalists, or will dismiss a case if it doesn't appeal to his ideology. Mind you, there will have to be three impeachment attempts for this to go through. So over two, oh, 200 years ago? Yes. Okay. The only, and as for the other part about uh, fundraising and gift giving, I have the Supreme Court Code of Conduct open right here with me, where it says that a justice can participate in these nonprofit organizations directly, or with their name, their likeness, etc. And but it cannot be used for personal gain. Or that's a, somewhat what it's saying right here on the page. And one thing I am leaving out, uh, we talk about appearance of impropriety. Thomas is sat on cases related to January 6th, and uh, along those lines that Trump has been involved. His wife Ginny was extremely involved in organizations that stopped the steal, which was saying that the, corrupt, the election was corrupt. So his wife is very strong on Trump's version of what happened, and yet Thomas is sitting on cases that deal with that issue. 
that, that alone is again the appearance of impropriety. And you say, well, I don't listen to my wife. I'll bring us into Alito in a second. But that doesn't look good. And he's been asked to recuse himself. Uh, in the um, case you guys hopefully know about, the Citizens United case, when Citizens United was decided, uh, it was a 5-4 decision, therefore Clarence Thomas's opinion, deciding on behalf of corporations is extremely important. Guess who worked for Citizens United, the company that, the, the nonprofit organization that brought the lawsuit? Ginny, his wife. And yet he decided, he sat on the panel that decided a case that his wife was involved with. Specter actually himself said, and this is a while ago, I remember he was a Republican, that Thomas should have recused himself, but he didn't. So th this is a history of, of, the, of this guy. Yeah, Frank. We're talking a lot about how uh, oh, the Supreme Court is biased and adheres to different agendas. But I want to bring up the topic of religion and how it affects the judges. Well, now we're getting into a leader. OK, go ahead. Out of the 116 judges who have ever been appointed to the court, 92 are Protestants and 15 are Protestants. If you do the math, that's the majority of all of our justices that we have ever had have had some sort of religious influence in their life. Now, is this to say that participating in religion immediately disqualifies you from being a judge? The answer is no. But to deny the fact that participating in a religion from any age or having any sort of influence in it would influence your own personal belief on how the law should be mandated and regulated is complete uh, malarkey. And I here have the religious makeup of the current court. John Roberts, key, uh, the Chief Justice, is a, ca is a Catholic. Clarence Thomas, Catholic. Sam Samuel Alito, Catholic. Sonia Sotomayor, Catholic. Elena Kagan, Judaism. Neil Borst, Anglican slash Catholicism. Brett, Catholic. Amy Conant Barrett, Catholic. Ketanji Brown Jackson, Protestant. To deny that, even though there is a different religions and different religious sects, to deny the effect that most of these religions have some things in common that might not appeal to the court of public opinion is inane. And the reality is most of their rulings have been affected by their own religious ideals. And a lot of the cases that have come out recently have strongly supported freedom of exercise. If we're talking about the Hobby Lobby decision. Let's talk about that for one second as so you're bringing up Judge Alito. Hobby Lobby is a case where the ACA, which was the Obamacare, which we know it by, it mandated that women's health care be taken care of also. That the employer, if you have a certain amount of employees, you have to pay for Obamacare, and that included uh, various different birth control devices. The Green family who owned Hobby, who still owns Hobby Lobby, proclaims to be very religious. And they felt that if the health care plan they're offering to their employees offers birth control, which they believe is in a abortion fashion, then they, it violates their religious right. Abortion fashion means something that causes an abortion. Uh, the birth control devices that they singled out do not and are not abortion fashions under science, but they believe it is. Judge Alito, who is a very strong uh, practicing religious person, uh, he found in favor of Hobby Lobby, saying that they did not have to pay for women's uh, birth control, which they believe is abortion fashion. Uh, he found that the interest of the Green family in their religion was greater than women and their health care. So when we're talking about a religious belief. We're supposed to keep our religious beliefs out of politics, out of our law. There's a First Amendment, separation of church and state. But yet Alito, who has made statements saying that we should be a Christian nationalist country, that means we are not, we are a secular country. We're not supposed to be founded in any religion at all. We are not sectarian, which is a country like Iran, which is, you know, Muslim supports one way. But yet he's moving us that way. 
Um, another case that he decided was the Kennedy case, where as a coach of a public institution, so the Constitution applies, and he would have prayer circles after every football game and mention, you know, in prayer with his players. Now, every player, is re they can pray all they want, but it's the moment that the coach joins them as a representative of the state that he's enforcing his religion. Um, Alito said that we're interfering with his right to practice his religion, uh, and it has no effect on the players. Judge Sotomayor, who is also Catholic, also was in dissent, said, wait a minute, the facts are that the players feel pressured. Uh, if they don't part of the prayer circle, that they may not play or they may not get on the team, so they're forced into going along with something they may not want to go along with, and players who are Muslim or Jews or Buddhists, Hindus, whatever the heck they are, go along with this very Christian prayer because they feel that they'll get sanctions. The interests of those people, again, weren't as important as the interests of, of the religious person. So Leto has been very clear in his agenda, and even the speeches he makes, that he believes that the U.S. should be a more religious nation, that it should be based on Christian values. So we have that as well. By the way, Alito has also received lots of gifts as well, but not as much as Thomas. So with that, I'm just interested in how confident do you feel that the Supreme Court is interpreting the Constitution in a legal way, or are they interpreting it according to an agenda? So who, who cares? Janet, do you want to talk? Um, well, I was actually thinking about this earlier, about you know, the Constitution. It's very outdated and it's used for a lot of arguments in the Supreme Court, but it can be misinterpreted and each person might have a different view on specific words, what statements and how they think those terms may, might mean. And it's just like, everyone's different, but they take it so personally the way that they interpret what the Constitution says. So it's like, they're the ones in power and they're the ones saying this is what it means when it can obviously mean a lot of different things, but it's all personal, so that's making a very big uh, what's the word? impact in how cases are settled and how they're decided because of the misinterpretation that the words can mean in the Constitution. It gives them a lot of power. I, j I just, I just want to uh, strike of what I just said. Uh, Alito was flying a flag outside his uh, summer home that's um, been interpreted as promoting Christian nationalism. And when he was confronted with that, he said, oh, that my wife did that. He threw his wife onto the bus. So I, in light of that, he has an agenda. He's flying a flag. And I, do you buy, oh, it's my wife that I don't have any uh, responsibility as a Supreme Court justice not to fly a Christian national, nationalism flag? Who wants to address that? Savannah? Um, yeah, I, just, I think he's trying to cover it up. You know, I, I just find it like really upsetting that belief can trump over fact so easily. And it's accepted. Like, how are we able to just go to one religion and not consider everyone else's religion or beliefs or, you know, scientific facts? And we're going to just blame it on this wife. I think that's just insulting. Does he think we're stupid? I don't. I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to answer that. Oh, Jim, what do you think of it? Yeah, I just think that even government officials and Supreme Court justices, they've become so brazen with their actions that they don't need to fear any repercussions. And anytime they're confronted, they give a, you know, a wishy-washy response and they sweep it under the rug because they know they can't be touched pretty much. So, it's when they're removed from this public sphere is when you get these results, when these judges can do whatever they want and nobody's really there to keep them in check. So I think it perfectly follows from what powers they're given because there's nothing you can do about it. Um, this is a little bit of a side tangent here because uh, 
I'd, I'd, I'd really like to push home that thing of in, there's no such thing as impartiality in the justices. Excluding religion, you can also talk about their educational background. Now, if I were to ask anybody here, where do you think are the top three schools where four more justices have been appointed from in all of history? Harvard. Harvard. Yeah. Yale. Yale. Princeton. Cornell. Stanford. Columbia. Dartmouth. Columbia. Those, those are the three more. Uh, Yale, Harvard, and Columbia have been the most who have put justices on the Supreme Court by four or more. Harvard taking the clear lead with 22 alumni and 18 graduates mm -hmm. being court justices. Yale Law, 11 alumni and 9 graduates. And uh, Columbia Law School with 7 alum alumni and 4 graduates as well. Just These are all close-knit close communities where, historically speaking, it's a self-serving circle where only the most rich and the most powerful meet each other and become friends behind closed doors mm -hmm. where they serve each other's interests. Oh, we got 10 minutes left? I want to go back to this point here, which is really interesting. You know, it, I think everyone can sense the polarization. I think you hear about this, the coarseness and all of this in the debate. But I think this is a great angle to take and the idea that think about how polarizing you would truly have to be to not have somebody on your side at this point. How could you get 61 or whatever, I think it's 60 required for impeachment. How could you possibly have 60 people not like you at this point unless there's just simply a supermajority um, in either one of these houses, right? So. People know, they can see it, they can sense it, they can sense that you know, there is uh, so much more runway than perhaps there was at one time uh, where something like this would, would not have been acceptable across party lines. But now it just seems that because of that, what you just mentioned, that it almost awards additional power because the actual chilling of consequences seems so far-fetched. Excellent point. Uh, just in the minutes we have left, I just want to push as well that Alito voted against uh, same-sex marriage. He was one of the dissenting votes and has been vocal that he'd want to overturn the Obergefell case, which is the one that gave the right to people to marry, same-sex marriage. So his, his agenda is his religion. Thomas's agenda is many things, but uh, money seems to be at least part of it. Uh, and what you said, there's no, there's no ramifications, there's no accountability. And, and we're getting cases like Dobbs that took away a woman's right uh, to her own body. We may see cases that take away birth control altogether. We may see cases that take away um, gay marriage. We may see cases that take away the Loving case, which, believe it or not, Loving versus Virginia, Loving was the case that struck down the, the law in Virginia that said white people and black people can't matter. I mean, this is going on based upon various different agendas that we're seeing. So just in the last, is there anything we can do is the last thing. Is there any way of holding accountability? I don't think so for right now unless there are more parties in both the Senate and the House, more than the two that we have right now. And if we relook at the system, because we can all agree it's corrupt, but the way of handling it is really up to our representatives. So it just needs to be more participation on our side. Right. To I don't think it's up to them, it's up to us. Yeah. Exactly. It's up to us. We have to demand, and I think there's been talk of term limits. Mm -hmm. And why not? Okay? Ten years. Okay? Ten years. So you don't stay there past you where you should. Uh, that there's been Supreme Court justices who stayed there, like Douglas, who was initially a good justice, but he stayed there with senility. Mm -hmm. um, they stayed too long. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg stayed too long. When she was, even though she was a great justice, she stayed too long. Ten years. That's it. Get other opinions in. Why should somebody dominate the legal environment for 30, 40 years? 
But that's insane. 50 years, maybe? You know, Connie Barrett is a very young lady. She could be in there God knows how long. That it should be term limits. I, and I think yeah, it's up to our, our legislators, but it's up to us to demand what we want from them. I and mean, what do you guys think of term limits in the last discussion we had? Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I would, say, I would say it would be a reasonable thing because you don't want like people going in, like you said, senility. You don't want issues like that involving it. And also, like you don't want to, because if you have the same person there for life, you can kind of like, the application of law can basically just be dependent on the personality and views of that person. Like for example, um, uh, what was it called, the, the Christian nationalist? Alita. Alita, right, his views are completely contrary to like what the Constitution was founded upon, but we kind of have to deal with what he, right, his rulings and his opinions because he's just there. So, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Beatrice, what do you I definitely do think that we need term limits. I think being a judge, that's like having a, such a big responsibility. And I just feel like, you know, when you're in that position, you have so much pressure from like trying to quote unquote do the right thing. I definitely think it's very easy to get swayed one way or the other if that's like the popular opinion. And I just, I don't know how I feel about judges being there like until they, you know, when they pass away. And I especially don't trust that it's the president that picked them either. Is that the point? Do you want 70, 80 year old people, men and women, making decisions for young people? I mean, that they, that's what happens. How about you? I think um, my friend brought this up like a few weeks ago. She was saying that like how they're voted on, I feel like maybe after like 10, five years, they should be like reevaluated and then re-voted on to like, they still have that power of not being blackmailed, but they still like, they have to like, listen to people and listen to the conversation and like do good by them. So it's a re-evaluation, yeah. a re-vote. Yes. So it's interesting. Yo, Joe? Well, I get why they want uh, the Supreme Court justices to stay the long term because, you know, we have to vote for the president, a mayor, a governor, and there's so many elections every year that they don't want to add this on as well. But I definitely think there should be an age requirement and so much can change in 10 years and appealing to different audiences, I feel like would need a different perspective rather than that person saying that. Um, term limits are definitely a must because it's really like you are above the law for the rest of your life and even if you go in there wanting to make a change power's going to get to you you're going to become selfish in some way somehow you're going to be biased you're going to want your beliefs to go first mm -hmm. I think a reevaluating idea is like terrific I think that should be in place especially huh? We need more churn. The average American's age is 38. The average person making decisions in government is nearly double that. So the reality is we need more churn. We need more young people in these roles. It's term limits across the board, not just the Supreme Court. You need term limits across the board. And no one typically willingly will give power away on their own. Some people are doing a great job of giving Biden his flowers, but I want everyone to be thinking twice about that. I don't know that he willingly wanted to step away uh, when he did, but he did do it. Yeah. So I agree term limits are ideal, but quite frankly, I don't see that. Because like you said, the people want to hold on to power. I think the more likely option would be a hard age limit. So I'm either like, if it were to happen, I'd see retirement age, but ideally I'd see something like around 55, like air traffic controllers have to retire at 56 because they experience burnout and stress from this, it's a high stress job. And I can only imagine the Supreme Court you're in the same boat. So I feel like age cap at like 55, 56, before you start hit, unfortunately, like cognitive decline, and before the stress or other outside factors get to you, mm -hmm. like I, th I feel like that'd be ideal if you couldn't pass term limits. Yeah, I mean, we, I don't see, change coming from top down. It's definitely going to have to be something that we are involved in. And I don't see that happening unless there's more participation by, like what you said, like all groups and more younger groups. 
And I feel like one solution or maybe like something I've been thinking about lately is that if we need more participation and this democracy runs off of what the people think, a vote shouldn't be something that's a duty more than it is a requirement. To have a system based on what people believe, then you must have the people speak and have a say in what their government is doing. And that should be something that we are all given as, just like we do taxes to participate in capitalism, democracies should ask all of us to participate in the system because that is how it runs, that is how, that's how it betters itself. So in that way, we can have, it would be more gradual, but we can have what we want eventually than just waiting here and saying what's next and what the politicians are going to do. It could be on us. Right. I, I definitely have to agree with that statement. The, as amazing as these solutions that have been given here are, the reality is they're either too extreme by our current policies, too radical, or simply something that would just probably never happen. The, the only one that I can realistically see happening is maybe a reconsideration every 10 years to be voted on by Congress. But age limits, retirement age, those aren't things that are going to realistically happen, and I don't think there ever would be. And I don't think it would be a good thing if they did happen. I think making requirements for the Supreme Court isn't the best idea either, just because I feel like the fact that they don't have requirements is something that's good. Um, I don't think the age limit thing. Yeah. And who would set who would set the requirements? It would be somebody with their own bias. That's true. It would be so. It would be arguably even easier to restrict who could or couldn't be a judge if we were to put uh, requirements in place. And like look, like we were talking about with like Harvard and Yale and Columbia, uh, those aren't requirements, but we're still appointing people who are from the best law schools and who are have the best experience and who are like a society says like if you're older you have more um, you're more wiser so that's why they're getting appointed. Yeah. Clarence Thomas wasn't exactly the most Wise. qualified <laughs> person. So I'll one last comment. Um, I think being part of the system is very important. Everyone should vote in a special constitutional law. I said it enough, okay? It's the Constitution Day Special Evan, and I want to thank everyone right. for participating uh, in, in today's discussion. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. So thank you all so much for coming in and talking about SCOTUS and the power that they hold. It's so important for us to keep talking about these issues, to change society's normal, and to further inform and educate others about it. Thank you to Evan Lane and Patrick Ryan for hosting this event. And again, we post our roundtables on our YouTube and SoundCloud, and we are broadcasted on the first and third Sundays of each month from 8 to 9 a.m. on G-Town Radio, 92.5 FM WGGT. Thanks for listening, and have a great day.